Hello. In this video, we're going to look at the dependence of the Gibbs energy on pressure and temperature changes in various physical systems. We'll first go back to the fundamental equation we derived in a previous video, which shows the temperature and pressure dependence of the Gibbs energy. Um, the temperature dependence, of course, expressed by the first term here, negative SDT. Pressure dependence indicated here in the second term. Um, that, of course, means that as we look at these two terms, uh, the temperature dependence and the corresponding partial derivative is simply equal to negative S. Um, and for the pressure dependence, we'll note that, of course, the corresponding partial derivative is just simply equal to V. All right, so let's take a look first at solids and liquids. Um, we'll start with, and we'll look at the pressure dependence. Uh, we will, we'll look at the temperature dependence later on. Um, so we know that if the temperature is held constant uh, from the equation on the previous slide, that dG is equal to VdP. Um, and of course, to get delta G occurring during a pressure change, we simply integrate both sides of the equation. Um, and uh, now, uh, for solids and liquids, we'll note that they are relatively incompressible. Um, and what that means is that volume doesn't change much during a pressure change. So we're going to make an assumption here that it's because it's close to being constant, we'll pull it outside the integral. Um, and we're left with this simple expression here, which then follows after integration that for solids and liquids, um, we can make a reasonable approximation that delta G is equal to the volume times the change in pressure. Uh, now, of course, for gases, this is a different situation. Uh, for a gas, an ideal gas, for example, we cannot make that assumption that the volume is independent of pressure. Of course it is, but what do we do? Uh, we will substitute the ideal gas law for volume into this equation, as we have done many times before. Um, and we do the integration, assuming the temperature is constant, um, so we end up with uh, this simple relationship here for delta G uh, for the uh, pressure change for an ideal gas. Okay, so let's look at a simple example here involving a solid conversion, uh, graphite to diamond. Uh, we know, of course, that Superman can take coal in his bare hands and, and when he squeezes it, he can convert it into diamond. So let's, let's talk about that process of graphite to diamond conversion. One thing we note is, of course, and we've said this many times, and you should be aware of this, that uh, graphite is the most stable form of carbon at one bar pressure, standard pressure. Um, and we can simply uh, note this by looking at uh, the Gibbs energies of formation. The standard Gibbs energy of formation for graphite, looking in the back of the book, is zero, which is, again, indi indicative of the fact that it's the most stable form of carbon. Um, that for diamond is 2.90 kilojoules per mole. Um, if we just simply want to calculate delta G for the conversion of diamond to graphite, um, then we just take the difference between the two. And we'll note that that difference is equal to negative 2.90 kilojoules per mole. Um, that being negative means that the conversion of diamond to graphite is spontaneous. Delta G being less than zero means we have a spontaneous process under standard conditions. That's one bar pressure. All right. so what's going on here then? Um, how can we convert graphite to diamond? And, and again, why is there so much diamond? Well, not that there's a lot of diamond, but why does diamond even exist if graphite is the most stable form at one bar pressure? And, you know, how is it that Superman is able to convert coal to diamond? Well, this involves a change of pressure. Um, graphite is indeed more stable than diamond at one bar pressure. Um, but we'll note here that diamond is more dense than graphite. Um, you can look up the values and find that that um, is indeed the case. Um, and that is critical. Um, that means that because it's more dense, um, it's going to be more stable at higher pressures. You can simply rationalize this. As you raise the pressure, um, the solid's going to want to reduce its volume, um, and it can reduce its volume by increasing its density. So, so diamond is going to be more stable when we go to higher pressures. 
um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, um, so that how do we calculate at what pressure diamond does become more stable? Well, um, as we raise the pressure, we're going to note that um, the um, difference in the uh, delta G for the conversion is, is going to get closer to the favoring diamond and at one point at a high enough pressure delta G will be equal to zero and that's a transition point that would correspond to equilibrium delta G is equal to zero at an equilibrium so what we want to be able to do is increase delta G for this process from negative 2.90 kilojoules per mole to zero by raising the pressure now again how do we know that raising the pressure will do this well certainly if Superman is squeezing it hard enough he's obviously increasing the pressure but again mathematically this works out by realizing again the density difference if diamond is more dense then that means that it's got a smaller volume so if you take the change in volume the difference in volume between graphite and diamond as we see here uh, we're going to notice greater than zero because diamond will have a smaller volume than graphite okay we also note from the previous slide that delta G is equal to V times delta P and so if we're talking about the change in delta G which is what we're talking about when we talk about change in delta G we're talking about going from this value of 2.9 negative 2.9 0 kilojoules per mole to 0 for this reaction of diamond being converted to graphite a change in delta G for the reaction is going to be equal to delta V for the reaction right notice we just slap a delta we take our previous equation here and put a delta in front of the terms so the change in delta G for the reaction is going to be equal to delta V for the reaction times delta P for the process well if delta V for the reaction is indeed greater than zero as it is here and delta P is greater than zero that means that delta delta G must be greater than zero which is exactly what we want um, we want delta G to change to increase again it's going from negative 2.9 to zero so we want that to be greater than zero and so what this means is that because delta V is greater than zero a delta P an increase in pressure will lead to this change so again increasing the pressure will indeed cause delta G to increase and therefore we will eventually at a high enough pressure reach an equilibrium between graphite and diamond um, that would correspond to a transition pressure and then of course if we go to pressures above that diamond will become the more stable of the two carbon allotropes again let me reiterate here um, and this will become a little bit more clear when we do this exercise in class but in order to make diamond more stable than graphite we have to raise the pressure and this is simply because delta V for the process of converting diamond to graphite is greater than zero all right, um, because diamond has a smaller density so because diamond has a smaller density it will at a high enough pressure be more stable than graphite so all we need to do is figure out what that pressure is and that will be the subject of a MathCAD exercise that we do in class to calculate the pressure at which the delta G for the graphite diamond conversion is equal to zero corresponding equilibrium and again we know any pressure exceeding that equilibrium pressure will result in diamond being more stable than graphite all right, so that was the pressure dependence. Let's now talk about the temperature dependence of our Gibbs energy. Um, and again, we go back to our original relationship here. Um, whereas in this case, since we're interested in the temperature dependence, we're interested in the second term. So our partial derivative is equal to negative S, um, as we noted before. Now, if we remember the definition of Gibbs energy as being equal to H minus TS, then will note that negative s, just a simple re algebraic re rearrangement, um, gives us g minus h over t. Um, 
And so, again, rearranging that equation where we take dg dt is equal to g minus h over t. Rearranging that, um, we have this expression here. Okay, Dividing through this expression by t um, gives us this. All right. And then we can simplify that. And let me go through just a little bit of how that works out. Okay, um, If we take the derivative of g over t with respect to t, okay, um, we end up with, uh, we have to use the product rule here. And the product rule would say that uh, we take d times the derivative of 1 over t with respect to t plus 1 over t times the derivative of g with respect to t. That's the simple product rule uh, for derivatives. Um, you'll note that I haven't used the subscripts here, subscripts here indicating constant variables simply uh, just to make it a little bit simpler in writing this down. Okay. Um, well, the derivative of 1 over t with respect to t is just negative 1 over t squared. Um, and so simplifying that, we end up with negative g over t squared plus 1 over t dg dt which is, in fact, identical to what we have on the left side of the equation here. And so now we see that because those are identical, that that expression is indeed equal to dg over t dt. So it's just a simplification of the uh, expression with two terms that we have here to expression where we have a derivative of one term. This is something we'll see again um, in, in future derivations. Um, it just makes our life a little bit easier. We don't have to write as much. Um, and, of course, um, that's g over t. If we want to know how delta g for a reaction, for example, or a physical process might change with respect to temperature, again, we just slap a delta in front of the g and a delta in front of the h, and we have what's known as the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, which is very useful for calculating changes in delta g with respect to temperature. Uh, one particular um, process that we're going to be looking at, and, and there will be a future video that shows how we do this calculation, is how um, the uh, water vapor pressure will increase with an increase in temperature. Um, you should know, of course, that the vapor pressure of a liquid is an equilibrium at the equilibrium uh, between the liquid and the vapor at a given temperature. Uh, so when we talk about water vapor pressure, we're talking about an equilibrium between the liquid and the vapor, water vapor, um, at a particular temperature. Um, and we also know that at equilibria, as we noted before, delta G is equal to zero. So we're going to use that delta G being equal to zero um, and the Gibbs-Helmholtz expression on the previous slide to calculate how much pressure increase we'll see with a 2 Kelvin temperature rise, which is consistent with what we might expect with um, global warming. Um, so in addition to all the other effects that we've discussed with regard to global warming and climate change, we're also going to note that because we're increasing the temperature, the vapor pressure of water will increase, uh, which will have also have impact on cloud cover and the climate. Um, and uh, water distribution throughout the world. So uh, this is a calculation that we'll be doing in MathCAD, um, and that will be the subject of a future video. Stay tuned.